I always enjoy these sessions because it's such a wide variety of people and opinions that out of that um, there must be something positive which arrives at the end of the day. And the fact that it's been going on for so many years means that there has been value and virtue in this exercise. The performance of the St. Kitts and Nevis economy since 2013 has been very encouraging and has been the bright spot in the ECCU as we continue to be affected by the global crisis. This performance has been due to an effective implementation of a robust adjustment program conceived by the government within the guidelines of the eight-point stabilization and growth program and assisted by the IMF with financing and monitoring. This performance by Sinkitz and Nevis is indicative of what is possible if the conduct of our economic policies is carried out within the conceptual framework of a broad macroeconomic framework which addresses not only adjustment, but also a growth stimulus and social safety nets which address those who are least capable of defending themselves in difficult circumstances and preparing them where possible for gainful employment in the economy. The first five points of the eight-point program can, in the case of St. Kitts and Nevis, be said to have been successfully executed, namely financial programming, fiscal reform, debt management, public sector investment programming, and the social safety nets. The other element which has made the recovery possible has been the Citizens by Investment program, which has brought much in needed foreign exchange from the government for the government, which could then embark on an effective stimulus program and finance the social safety nets. This program is now being emulated by other members of the currency union, and we hope that it will bring them similar benefits. Economic growth in the Federation turned positive in 2013 after contraction which started in 2009 and is projected to average about 3% and possibly over this up to 2017 in the first instance. The challenge facing the country now will be the sustainability of this performance in the current environment of an increasing competitive national economy in which no quarter is given and none is asked for. This evolving environment is evidenced by the following. The removal of concessional trade arrangements, which have affected and caused the demise of the two major agricultural export commodities in the ECCU, sugar and bananas. The difficulties they have had in trying to create viable international financial sectors. The experience of Antigua and Barbuda with the online gambling industry, in which they won their case at the WTO but could not get the judgment against the United States implemented. The current challenges to the Citizens by Investment program, which is coming from several quarters, even from countries which had these programs for years. There's also the issue of the need to urgently improve our productivity and international competitiveness in the areas that we intend to make a living from. This crisis and its aftermath gives us the opportunity to chart a new course which will ensure an increased standard of living and quality of life for our citizens if we chart a strategic and focused goal path to our goals. The fundamental issue would be achieving sustainable growth over an extended period of time to achieve the following. A doubling of per capita incomes by the year 2030, the reduction of poverty to below 4%, substantial reduction and possible eradication of poverty, improvement in human development indices by the UN, attaining and sustain and surpassing the Millennium Development Goals, and a diversified and competitive economy. This will require a growth rate of 3% consequent upon a phase of adjustment, which the Federation has already achieved, moving to 5 to 7% from about 2017 onwards. To be realistic about achieving these goals, we must be realistic about our circumstances and the external environment. For instance, there are factors outside of our control which we must seek to treat with through our resilience and flexibility. However, the factors that are within our purview, we must ensure that we do them with excellence and to the best of our ability. In the context of the factors which we must contend with in our quest for development, there are three which are of great importance. They come under the headings of fundamental structural issues, 
institutional issues, and the binding resource constraints. Fundamental structural issues would include small size, openness, vulnerability, seasonality, and the cyclical impact of the business cycles of our main trading partners. Institutional issues would cover constitutional and political regimes, socioeconomic environment, the policy framework and architecture, and the administrative and technical capacity to execute things. Resource constraints would involve an inventory of our actual and potential human and physical resources, the supply factors which may be placed along the demand for goods and services. This would give us an idea of whether we could satisfy our wants from our resources. This is particularly critical, a critical assessment for small states such as ours, situated as we are close to the most developed mass consumption society in the world. This also poses challenges for our competitive multi-party political systems, as it is sometimes difficult to manage the expectations of our fairly modern polities and societies, which at the same time have not yet reached an advanced stage of economic development. The instruments and agents which we must have to attain our objective are the government, or the state, as we would call it, the private sector, and the financial sector. In societies such as ours, the state has a very important role to play in setting the rules of the game, providing law and order, regulating the economy and the financial system, and giving incentives to encourage productive activities. The state, very importantly, provides critical physical and social infrastructure, which is the platform on which the private sector must perform to drive the economy forward. The private sector and the ECCU has a very important task of changing the structure and orientation to compete in the international environment if we are to achieve sustainable rates of growth. I just want to pause here to say that in our analysis of the private sector in the ECCU, we find that there's a somewhat of an imbalance so that you have a large informal sector, and you have a formal sector which concentrates in wholesale, retail, real estate, and construction. There are some other um, productive activities, but in the main, um, that is what we have. In order to change that imbalance, that has to be re re uh, recast so that we can have a private sector which is very competitive in the external environment because that is where we earn our foreign exchange, which then follows through into the economy um, to propel such things as construction, um, real estate, part of you. And I want to make this fundamental point because many times it's, it seems that construction is pulled out as a leading sector. Right? It depends on the amount of foreign exchange, like in the CBI, which allows you then to do the things um, that follow because we don't produce any of the things, for example, in construction, which are used to go into that thing. We have to pay for those things with foreign exchange. And so we have to understand these connections in the economy um, before we get a little off track. The financial sector in the ECCU also has to be restructured to be an effective instrument for the mobilization of savings and the allocation to production instead of the overwhelming portion going to consumption activities. And that's another imbalance which mirrors the, the one I just mentioned. Because if the private sector is oriented that way, then the financial sector will also be um, oriented that way. But what we want is a, a financial sector which can provide funding at the medium and long term end of the market so that export activities can be put forward where then we can reach into the, the rest of the economy with the retail and other things that go with that. So there are these two imbalances in the economy which we have to treat with if we are to get sustainable growth over time. The Prime Minister's New Year's address to the nation captured the essence of the fundamentals necessary to propel us forward both in St. Kitts and Nevis and the currency union as a collective association of states united in an economic union. He highlighted the domestic actions which were taken and which still have to be taken to address the fundamental problems. However, he clearly outlined the external environment of globalization in which we exist and we'll have to cope with as this process is clearly not reversible. He also struck a critical note with respect to the OECS Economic Union, namely the need to reduce the cost of government and to increase its efficiency and effectiveness through cost collaboration. 
the cost of providing public goods and services is extraordinarily high for very small states and constrains our ability to compete both regionally and internationally. And the Master of Ceremonies um, introduced me and said I worked in another, another area. And there I learned, I learned to count those costs. And I said they are disproportionately high for small, small states. The unit cost of governments which have to provide so many things in our society, is what will tend us towards fiscal deficits as well as in debt. In conclusion, the critical factor in this whole process is going to be the quality of human resources we can put to the task. There are seven factors which are important. Three involve physical matters, namely the environment, energy, and transportation. And these are absolutely critical. Uh, we are now moving to green economies, and I think the OECS countries are very much in the vanguard there, because in small islands, uh, we can get overwhelmed, not only by climate change, but emissions which cannot be absorbed in such a small land space. Energy, the energy costs that we have, are again, are extremely high. Um, we are paying something like over 40 cents a kilowatt for electricity. We have competitors like Trinidad and Tobago with seven cents, the United States at four and five four and five cents. Um, that does not compute in the era of competitiveness. And therefore, a very good um, trend is the search for alternatives and really to make the use of the present facilities more efficient. Transportation is absolutely critical. Uh, the ability to get from island to island, the ability to get to the international system is extremely important if we are going to be competitive. The next three involves the quality of human resources, so that we talk about education skills training, we talk about research and development, and we talk about the use of ICT. In contrast to the first three, these deal with the brain and knowledge. And that is where, given our small size, we can get economies of scale, but also increasing returns to scale because knowledge has no boundaries, and therefore we need to move in that particular direction. What is very interesting, I just say this as an aside, um, recently in comparing our OECS countries with Barbados and the countries of Singapore and Taiwan, what is very obvious, I mean, if you take Barbados, for example, Barbados is probably the most mature of our economies. Very high per capita incomes, very good infrastructure, but still dependent on tourism and financial services, and therefore they have to react to the rest of the world. They're very much influenced by that. And in Barbados recently, we have seen quite um, a decline in economic activities because, like us, even though they advance, and they still have to cope um, with that external element. In Singapore and Taiwan, where is a great deal of science and technology uh, in use, you can, you can see that those economies are more resilient and can react to the external environment because they're producing goods and services, high-tech services, which the international community needs. And that is why how you remain on the cutting edge. So I'm making a plea here um, for a greater attention to education skills training as well as research and development. Research and development is so critical to advancement, it is, it is just not funny. And of course, ICT, which fits in with all of those things. But the critical thing there is the application of these knowledge skills to the resolution of the development problem. And here, um, I, I want to, to tell you my experience with a project that the Taiwanese government is doing, as you know, um, in this country. And it is the epitome of how you address the development problem. It addresses agriculture with a high science content. It addresses tourism. It addresses science and technology to the solar, the solar arrangements. There's a part where they've, they've shown us where building material sourced nearby um, has been used, it's stronger, stronger compound than what we have. And the most um, delightful of, of those innovations is 
the fact that they've been able to keep the monkeys at bay uh, by using an electrical current. Now, that may seem frivolous, but um, the loss um, to agriculture by the predations of, of monkeys is very significant. And so why I put that forward is the whole issue of the resolution of development problems by the application of science and technology, as well as probing, right, probing for solutions that are within our tight scientific capability or that we can source this capability to apply to these particular problems. We have to narrow the odds and increase the chances of our survival in this very challenging environment. It is only by careful planning, steadfastness of purpose, and collective action that this will be achieved. We have a great opportunity in these islands because we do have a certain approach to things which, if improved over time, will get us to achieve our goals. But it does really require collective action and serious thought. I emphasize that serious thought on how we go out resolving these things. I thank you.